when I got invited out to work at, at Weta Digital on Avatar, I didn't apply for that job. I got invited to do it based on my reputation and the people that I knew and the, and the relationships that I've made. It was an invitation. That's huge. That's, that's the goal is that your reputation precedes you so much that you're being flown across the, the world to work on a, another production. Sight unseen, <laughs> you know? You're listening to the CG Spectrum Podcast. CG Spectrum College of Digital Art and Animation offers specialized career training for the film and game sector. Join our hosts, Career Development Manager Maxine Schnepp and CGS Mentor Justin Mullman as they chat with industry experts doing cutting edge work in film and games. Now, on to the show. This week, I got to talk to Mark Ployblank. He's a friend of mine because we work together at CG Spectrum College. He is one of our longest standing mentors, so I've learned a lot from him. He's also the co-founder and head of VFX at Thea Interactive, and he's also an animation lecturer at Cal State University. He's been an animator at Sony, What a Digital, Rainmaker, and some of his film credits include Avatar, The Adventures of Tintin, The Night at the Museum, and many others. He got into animation in his 30s, so I'm really excited because you're going to learn about how it's not too late to follow your dream. Hope you like it. I did. I grew up on a, on a, on a farm in, in a red deer. My parents farmed and my brothers farmed, but I was the youngest. So I didn't do a lot of that stuff because there just wasn't time to teach me how to farm and stuff. So I was kind of left behind a lot. And so I just would draw because what else are you going to do on a farm? I, it was a, it, I grew up in this mobile home trailer that sat at the very top of a hay field. So if you opened up my front door, it was a hay field. And my back door, it was gas pumps and barns. You know, I didn't have any friends nearby or anything like that. So I just would draw all the time. And But you couldn't make a, a living drawing. And so as a kid, I always had these dreams. I really loved movies. And I my my dream as a kid is like, I, I wanted something to do with movies, but I didn't think I could like you know, be on screen because I have a face for radio and there, I didn't know what my place would be. So I thought, Hey, I think I could probably be on screen. I know. And here I am. It's your big break. I knew. And I was right. I thought like, Oh, I could be a stunt man. You know, I thought that sounded kind of cool because I can take a punch. I have three older brothers, so I can take a punch, but I'm scared. It turns out I'm scared of heights. Uh, well, I don't, I shouldn't say I'm scared of heights. I'm saying I have a rational fear of heights because of gravity. I, I also liked to, uh, I, I had a, I had a guitar kicking around and so I played that and I taught myself how to play guitar. And then, uh, I moved to Vancouver and when I was like, when I got out of high school, I got in with some, with some musicians and did that whole, like signed a record deal and made a record and toured and did all that kind of stuff. And I just always kept drawing. And then I decided I wanted to not live in a, in a tour bus anymore. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do now? So at the ripe old age of 33, which is probably the most interesting thing for anybody who's looking at, at, at studying animation or changing the career, it seems to be that's the most compelling story for them is that I went back to school when I was 33. And yeah. it's one thing, my son was just asking me about this is like, he, cause I, I told him I was, I was going to be talking with you today. And he said, well, what the hell do you have to say? And I said, well, it's kind of a compelling story. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, because he's my son, you know, he knows I'm yeah, yeah, shit. Yeah. But yeah. I said, it's kind of a compelling story because it's it's one thing to go back to school to learn a new trade is learning to to become an animator. It's a it's a it's a bit more of a stretch. It's not as obvious as like, well, I'm going to I'm going to learn how to be a plumber, like which isn't easy. I have a student and this has happened a few times. This is kind of interesting is is uh, I currently have a student and she's a veterinarian. And that's a tricky profession to get into, you know, and Ooh. she does like cow C-sections, which is crazy. So she opens them up and these things, these things, their their calves drop out and then she's got to sew them back up again. I, I had another student one time who was a, he was a, um, a vascular surgeon. He called himself a seamstress. So he sewed together like veins and stuff. Like he's sewing together like the oh. messiest stuff. I would just, it would drive me crazy. But the, the, I bring these two up because they were really, really good animators very quickly. Like really mm. good, really fast. And so I was talking to this, this young woman who's a veterinarian. And I said, the one thing that you're clearly good at is learning. And she said, oh yeah, I know how to learn. And that, that's an interesting thing because... The, the hardest thing about learning something new is this like 
emotional distraction that you don't know how it's going to turn out. And that's super, super scary. And with animation, it's doubly scary because there's another distraction that when you tell people in your life that you're going to do this, like, hey, I'm 33, I'm, I've decided I'm going to become an animator. Well, they look at you like you're you're stupid. Like, that's a crazy thing to do. They're like, and people said that to me, too. It's like, don't you think it's time you grew up? And I'm like, no, I'm not quite yet. But I would get this like, oh, that's not very responsible. You yeah. know, because it's because people understand it. And they don't understand like everybody understands plumbing. I mean, they don't understand plumbing, but they understand that that's a profession and that's a noble one. And that's something like, uh, you know, it's a harder sell as a young person to say, I want to be an animator. And it's a hard sell as a as as an older person saying, I want to be an animator as well, because it is it, or anything to do with visual effects, because it doesn't. It does seem like a little bit of a crapshoot. And 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 we tend to we anything that we do that's in sort of the I guess, for lack of a better term, the creative industries. We don't give ourselves grace around it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, this idea of like, we, I just had this conversation with somebody about karaoke. And this guy said, oh, I can't go to karaoke because I can't sing. I'm like, of course you can. Of course you, you can. And people say, oh, I just don't have a good voice. But people who know how to sing practiced. Like, or I shouldn't say know how to sing because everybody knows how to sing. Anybody who can make sounds, which isn't everybody, but most of us can make sounds. We know how to sing but we don't give ourselves any leeway at all. We try it once and go, nope. And we, we, and this goes into like making music, drawing, animating. We've, we've cultivated this like false narrative. That's, that's that, that, and we tell ourselves like, well, I just wasn't born with any talent on one hand. It like it, it, it does a huge disservice to the person who's saying it and believes it because they're just not going to try. And on the other hand, it's really insulting to the, to the person who's actually worked hard and become successful to say like, well, you're just lucky you were born with talent. I'm like, Oh, that hurts. <laughs> so it's like yeah. that completely disregards like the, 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 the effort. I remember my, my uh, former uh, uh, partner said to me one day, the thing I like, the thing that impresses me the most about you, she's talking about me is that you don't, uh, you don't, care that you're bad at stuff you do it anyways and i said uh well yeah of, of course like why would i not do so something just because i'm bad at it and she said well i only like to do things i'm good at i'm like well then you won't do anything so what happens and a lot of people you know what <laughs> i mean why like they broke up because you told her that she's not good at anything <laughs> well I'm like i didn't i'm <laughs> joking but that and, that and other reasons but uh she had a certain skill set that led her into a uh, profession that was a good fit, but it wasn't necessarily something she wanted to do. It just was the, the easiest thing for her to do because it was a, just an easy fit, but she doesn't like it. But mm. to try something else is paralyzing because you yeah. got to go through that period of time where you're bad at something that you want to be good at and it's demoralizing and you feel like, less than and all that sort of stuff. So it's very difficult. So going back to the, the veterinarian, when I said, said to her, you know how to learn. And she said, Oh yeah, I know how to learn. I think that's the biggest part of it is this, is this confidence that it's okay if I'm bad. Cause I know I won't always be bad. And every minute that you spend on your craft is a minute, you're a minute better. Mm. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. yeah. And like knowing that you're not going to go backwards if you keep trying something yeah like you know what i mean you're not gonna go back to drawing stick figures if you're drawing yeah. every single day yeah yeah and the consistency there will be a there will be a lack of consistency like there 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 was a, i remember very clearly a period of time where like i would do good work and then suddenly i would do something that looked like i've never done this before and that's just a lack of consistency based on um lack of experience Hey everyone, a quick shout out to CG Spectrum for helping make this podcast happen. CG Spectrum is an online animation, VFX, digital painting, and game development school that prepares you for a career in film and games. Whether you're just starting out or you're upgrading your skills, get personalized career training and mentorship from industry pros who have worked on blockbuster films and best-selling games. Courses are 100% online and you can choose from one-on-one -on -one private mentorship options or group classes with just four students max. 
You'll also get access to career support services and join an awesome community full of like-minded creatives just like you. Learn more at cgspectrum.com. We're bringing the industry to you. I know that you have all of this great insight now because you have this experience, you've done it, but going back to that early career where you decided to go back to school and you're like, okay, I'm going to be an animator at 33. I'm assuming you didn't know all this stuff yet. Mm -hmm. So how, how was that? Like, what did you, like, what were your expectations and how quickly did you get a job? Like how, how did that process go? It was really, really, really um, difficult, but also amazing. Like I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it was really, really scary. I had a two-year-old, not even a two-year-old, one and a half-year-old and and one on the way when I went to school. And and my children's mother um, wasn't a, we were in Canada and she wasn't a Canadian citizen. She was a, a U.S. citizen. So she, and plus she was pregnant and so we were a zero income family. So there was a lot of pressure. I felt a lot of pressure. My head was in a vice from sun up to sundown. I mean, that's self-imposed. It didn't have to be. And, and fortunately, like I, I had a, uh, I, she, she was a very supportive partner. And so I had a lot of support. It was wonderful. She was wonderful um, to help me through it, help us through it. It's really, really scary because, well, I learned about like this, well, I learned about process and, and, uh, um, it's a funny thing because I was so desperate. I remember thinking like, man, I wish I could just like take a pill that would just instantly make me better at this. And I asked students today, I said like, if you, who here, if you could take a pill and you just be a great animator, who, who here would take it? Of course, everybody would, but the, 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 that, that thinking is really interesting to me because it just highlights this 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 sort of backwards notion that it's results over process and results are are inevitably shallow and the and the more the 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 more you work at your craft the better the results become but also what happens is the less you care about them so it's this weird kind of thing of like you really in the in the beginning you really want this result this professional result and you don't know how to get it and you see other people doing it you're like ah I don't know how they're doing that and it's frustrating and it's it's like it's the scary uh, thing because it's not like you're bummed about being bad at what you're trying to do it's about not knowing what to do about that and the answer is deceptively simple which is just do more that's it. Uh, but it doesn't always feel like doing more is working, but it's just the only answer. There's no way to, to, to get at your, at your best work. I, I, I would start to visualize because I was getting frustrated and scared and distracted with emotion, all this kind of stuff and the pressure. And so I would visualize my best work was actually like lived out here somewhere. Like it was there. I, I just, I visualized that it existed and between it and me was just this like long, like, you know, tube of shit that I just had to dig through and just move these bad animation pieces out of the way. But I had to do it. I couldn't just, I couldn't go over it. I couldn't go around it. I had to actually go through them and remove these pieces of animation that also existed, but they existed in this process. And by doing that and going through that, what you realize is that the results start to, or the, the, the importance of the result, the result is huge. The process is small. The process is a burden. You know, when you first start, you're digging for this result and the process is just like you're enduring it. And it's this burden or this task that you got to fight your way through. And, you know, it gets so cumbersome that even just seeing like you get up in the morning and you sit down at your computer and you see that little, you know, Maya icon and you're like, ah, oh, that thing, every, I don't even want to click on it because everything about that thing makes me feel bad. It doesn't yeah. give me any positive feedback at all. It just keeps going like, hey, you're terrible. Um, and the second you do finally get something good, it crashes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. There, well, there's there's that. It's software. So, yeah. like, it's it's inherently horrible. People go to me like, uh, hey, what's your what's your favorite software? I'm like, none of it. It's all, it's all dog shit. Like, I hate all of it. My least favorite software is whatever I'm currently using, but it's also amazing. But the, the struggle with software is that it, it has all this promise and then you start to dig through it and then it just disappears. <laughs> um, when you, when you start to dig through it and, and start to like 
uh, look for these results, what happens is you start to fall in love with the process because you have these little, you, you, you develop this relationship with your process or other people would call it workflow. And you start to like have these little epiphanies and you start to like, Oh, right. If I put this here, this here, this here. And you think at the time, at least I did, I thought at the time, like I've developed this whole new great thing. And then you look at another anime. I was like, Oh, you're doing the same thing. Like everybody's, eh, there's, there's not that many ways to skin a cat, as they say with this, like it's the principles are the principles. And, and that's what we're looking for. But as you fight your way through it, you get your own personalized, like, like intimate relationship with your, I don't know if intimate's the right word with your software or with yeah, your, with your yeah. process and it becomes special to you and it becomes important. And so then what happens and I, 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 I learned this actually when I, be, when I started working in the music business and started learning music, which is also a long process. It, well, it's a lifelong process. Yeah. You um, pick two like really. <laughs> yeah. 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 Two really quite labor intensive. Yeah. Um, and I started and to dig through that. And yeah. yeah, like no, like they're moving targets for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as a young man, when I started, you know, as, as a lot of young people are, you're looking for cultural currency. You know, you're looking for a place in the world. And one of the most exciting places in the world is celebrity, right? We're, that's why young people are attracted to celebrity because it, it, it it's, it's the quickest way to pull us out of this, like, this, like, you know, uh, uh, sludge that's, that's like, you're nobody because you're nobody when you're young, you got nothing, you got no money, no cultural currency, you're nothing, but it's like, Oh, but if I, if, if I was famous, well, then I own everything. I'm, that's my thing. As you get older, you realize like, I just want people to leave me alone. But when you're younger, you just, you want everybody to know who you are. You want, you're like looking to, to, to make a, you know, to prove yourself. Yeah. But then yeah, as I got some as kind I, of acceptance, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I want to be the best. And, you know, we have as young people, it's why like, you know, movies like the Goonies or stranger things are very, very compelling because it's young people who are heroes and young people like 13 to forever, mostly, but young 13 to like 18 year olds, they have these, we all have these fantasies of like, I would just want to be a hero. I want everybody to like, I want there to be a parade in my honor because I saved the day. We fantasize about that stuff when we're young because we don't have any, we just don't have any clout. Um, but as I got into the music business and, and, and I started to become successful at it, I started to enjoy making the music and the accolades of it were actually quite hollow, which shouldn't have surprised me because people talk about that all the time, but it did. And people would come to me, like I would be, uh, you know, I lived in Vancouver at the time and it was the nineties, you know, so I had sideburns, <clears throat> no, but people would come to me and go, uh, like I'd, I'd be at a coffee shop and somebody would walk up to me and go, Hey, I saw you guys at this club, like back in whatever. And, and tell me like, this is, I, I, they tell me stuff about the show and what, what it meant to them and how exciting they were, excited they were about it. I'd occasionally sign an autograph. Somebody would have something for me to, to sign and stuff like a, like an old, uh, uh, CD jacket or something. Um, and that stuff's really nice. Well, what I really loved was like playing all ages shows with young people because young people are like, although they're quite mystified about the fact that you're a musician and stuff, they're looking at how do you do it? Cause they want to do it. And, and older people are like, well, they're not sober for starters, but I would use, I remember like playing shows to younger crowds and you would see these young people in the front row and they're into it, but they're watching my hands. You know what I mean? Mm. They're watching mm. what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And then like, I would have these like uh, effects pedals and I'd stomp one and a dude would like hit, hit, hit her friend or something. And at the point they go, Oh yeah. And they'd look at it. And then afterwards they, they would just ask me process questions. You know, like how often do you change your strings? You know, how, wh what's that pedal? Wh what are your settings? That that sort of stuff. Do you ever ch do you ever work with alternate tunings? All sorts of stuff that I'm super into. Like that stuff's like crack for for somebody who's into the process. And so the the, the animation business is the same. People go like, you know, there's like the cloak of glory. I call it. They go, hey, you worked on this movie. Hey, that's that's pretty great. And I saw that movie with my kids, and they tell you this little story, and a you know, and they want to have a piece of it or whatever. It's nice. But it's nothing like if somebody comes up and says, hey, what software did you use and how many frames of was this and that? And they, they understand the process of it. And then we can just nerd out on it because that's that just becomes the thing. I mean, a movie's a movie. 
you know, it's not like we're providing fresh water or anything like that. It's like it's a movie. Yeah. <laughs> so the product is funny. And I, 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 uh, I know I'm kind of rambling on, Maxine, but it's, it's all. No, no, no. I, I, well, this is why I love talking to you because I don't actually have to do much work. <laughs> Well, you have to you have to tolerate me, which is a, quite a bit of work. Yeah, and I have to like every once in a while like rein them in. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, but but entertainment is, um, you know, maybe it's not something that's keeping us alive, but I think it has advanced society. I have like a very visceral feeling of this because I was just in Rome and like just looking up at like frescoes on the ceiling, it gave, like gave me such a physical feeling, you know. And so th there is something about that that I think we've evolved with as humans. And I think that's comparable we, to Garfield. Some, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but we need entertainment, you know, and maybe it's to, mm -hmm. to mask all the other like stuff that we have to deal with now that we've created for ourselves as humans. Like we're not just like frolicking through a field. Not, not that people ever did that. I don't know. I mean, they're you know, I've done that or something before, but I've frolicked yeah. through fields. <laughs> well, we like stories, right? We love stories. Yeah. And, and to feel something else or to imagine something else, like you mm -hmm. said, with stranger things, like imagining being a hero it, even if mm -hmm. we never get to be one it's it's exciting to watch something that makes us feel something and maybe gives us hope for the future or even just makes us laugh for a little bit and so we mm -hmm. forget whatever the heck we're dealing with right now so yes it's not water in a glass um and it's a it's a luxury for many people to enjoy entertainment but I think more so than ever in the past, like you go back a thousand years, like a regular person maybe couldn't actually enjoy entertainment. Whereas now it's people all over the world. Many people have access to entertainment in some form that might help them in some kind of way, um, you know, to get through something, whether it's Garfield or, you know, or something else. I had this interesting, um, uh, exchange one time I was working on this movie. It was a very small movie, direct to DVD movie, right? Called uh, Dr. Doolittle three. Whenever I tell people I worked on Dr. Doolittle three, they usually say, did they make a two? I had a, um, an animator that was somewhat demoralized by this process working on Dr. Doolittle three. He felt he was, it was beneath him. And I talked to him one day about it because I was just trying to encourage him to like, let's let's get this movie out. And he was like, that's ah, such a stupid movie. And I said, listen, it's just, it doesn't matter what the movie is. What matters is the 60 frames in front of you or the 120 frames in front of you. Like, that's what matters. So why don't you forget about what the result is and what and the product is? And why don't you just focus on you're here, you walked through the door today and you sat down. Is your contribution going to be complaining or is it going to be like, just make this the best shot you can make? And he's like, eh. not that long after, I think maybe three or four years, I was working on a much larger film at a much larger studio, kind of a bit of a brass ring studio, you know, one of those higher upper echelon studios. And uh, he sent me a, this same guy sent me a, I hadn't heard from him for a couple of years and he sent me an email and he said, how did you do that? How did you go from Dr. Doodle 3 to this huge production? And I said, uh, because, yes, yeah, yeah. And I said, because you dummy, I don't see the difference. And I truly don't. I don't see the difference. My, my process, my enthusiasm, my professionalism is not dependent on the production. It's exactly the same. And so, and that was, a, and I didn't, hadn't really thought about it until he asked me, but I'm the exact same person doing the exact same job, the exact same, not the exact same job, but because my duties were a little bit different, my duties. It's, but I, 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 uh, I, I was, I was approaching it the exact same way with all this enthusiasm. And when, when you get stuck in this thing of like, you know, um, I'm saving myself to really, I'm saving my efforts for something that deserves it. You're always going to be waiting, but I was just doing it. And so if you're just doing it and it's such a, I mean, I wish I would have, I would have learned this younger when I was younger and like adults told me this kind of the same kind of thing all the time. But the secret to all this kind of stuff is like, whatever it is that you decide to do. And even if you don't want to do it, but you're doing it, it's like, well, you have made the decision because you can decide not to and catch the fallout for it. Like even just unloading a dishwasher when you're a young person is like, this sucks. 
But you do it and then you complain the whole time. And, you know, I was talking to one of my kids one time, they were unloading the dishwasher and they were doing it like plate by plate, slowly, like fork by fork. And I said, why are you doing it like that? And they said, because I don't want to do it. I'm like, so why are you making it harder? Like you don't want to do it, but you're, you're, you're literally like quadrupling your time doing it. You could be finished. I bet you, if you really wanted to, like if it was like the house is on fire, you, but you have to unload the dishwasher before you get out of the house, yeah. you, you could probably unload that thing in about 34 seconds, but you, so you're yeah. probably going to take 13 minutes. Like it's crazy. But you sound once like you, a fun dad to have around. Oh, man. oh my God. <laughs> I'm very fortunate. And my children are very, very, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Patient with me. For sure. But the, the whole that's the whole secret to the thing is whatever you decide to do, just do the shit out of it. And you can't do that all the time because there's all kinds of other, we're humans, we're not machines, you know, so we have emotions and stuff. I do a thing where I, I, I do this mindfulness thing where when I put my hand on the door, I look at it. I look at my hand and I look at my hand on the door, front door of the whatever studio I'm working at. And I just take a moment and make a conscious decision. Go like, okay, I'm going to make this great. And there's been twice that I can remember where I looked at my hand and I looked at my hand on the door and I knew that me walking through this door is going to have a net, uh, what do you call it? Not benefit. What's the opposite of benefit? It wasn't going to be good for anybody. So I went home. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a net negative for the people I work with. I just was in a sour mood. And I just wasn't feeling it. And, you know, I called it, I remember calling in sick one time on a production and they said, oh, uh, I hope you're feeling better soon. And I said, you know, I feel great now. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't bear seeing all of you people. And then there was a producer, you know, and uh, uh, she laughed and uh, I'm like, I'm not even joking. She's like, no, I know you're not, but you can get away with that kind of stuff. If like 90% or like say 75 to 80% of the time you're doing the best job you can do and you're not being snobbish about it and you're just killing it, that gives you all of this freedom to say, hey, I don't feel like it today. And people say, great, you go take time for you. But if you're always walking around complaining and you go, I don't feel like it today, it's like, well, yeah, you didn't feel like it yesterday either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it becomes a yeah, problem shocker. for you. Yeah, yeah. your life yeah, is going to yeah. be harder for that. It's just going to be way harder because nobody's going to want to be a part of it because that it's like that one bad apple thing. Like you get somebody in the production who complains and suddenly everybody's complaining. Unfortunately, we live in this society where, you know, we have to work to, to, to live mm -hmm. and make money. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, you could unload the dishwasher one tiny thing at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Close the cupboard, open it again, every plate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, be a little bit more efficient. But a lot of that comes down to how you load the dishwasher. If the <laughs> dishwasher is efficiently loaded, then you can yeah. efficiently remove the things from the dishwasher. I'm not going to get into that too much just in case my ex ever watches this, which I know he won't. But there, there's an efficient way to load the dishwasher. <laughs> oh, this, this sounds deep. My, my kids won't let me load the dishwasher anymore because they don't like to unload it after I've loaded it. Because you're a bad loader, maybe. You're, you're just like haphazardly throwing things in there. You got to put a little bit more thought into the process. Mark. It's one of the few times that benign neglect has worked in my favor. Incompetence, <laughs> just raw incompetence has worked in my favor. Um, so speaking of incompetence. Yeah, you... <laughs> I can say I can speak very, very much about incompetence. <laughs> well, I know I just wanted to finish that story of you know how you got that job <laughs> at the oh, very yeah. beginning. <laughs> like you know, because I mean, I've heard that story, but I, I, it's so inspiring to so many people, mm. especially those people who are like trying to do something new halfway through their life, or or, or like a quarter of the way in, whatever, and failing at something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, you know, because you didn't get, you didn't graduate and then get a job right away. Uh -huh. You, it was what, like a couple of years, maybe even after graduate or a couple of months yeah. or something I, after I, graduation. I, I'm sorry yeah. to like bring up your past trauma again. No, no, it's good. It's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting. I, I heard a, I, I heard a podcast today. Uh, I, I won't mention the name of the person being interviewed, but he's someone who's very, very successful. Uh, 
uh, at something that's very hard to be successful at. And so they, somebody asked him like, you know, how did you do this kind of, how did you, how did you achieve this level of success? And he said, because I failed so hard early on, I failed so hard. And he said that was incredibly difficult, but I wouldn't have gotten successful without it. And that's mm -hmm. true. And, and, and that, I think that's true in almost anything because like, Nobody comes out of the gate batting a thousand. You know what I mean? Every everybody like tries and fails because it's the only way to do it. I when I was when I was uh, eighteen years old, I decided you know I was I was living on this farm in in Canada. And I'm like I'm gonna go be a musician, and we didn't know anything about anything at that time. Me and my little farm family, and so my mom bought me for my gra high school graduation. She, she bought me luggage, <laughs> and she bought me a. Yeah a one-way plane ticket to Los Angeles because that's all we knew where like, that's where the entertainment industry was. And she's like, you should go to Los Angeles because you, you want to be a musician. And I didn't play, I didn't play an instrument at the time, but I thought I could pick it up. So this is really naive. But anyway, all that aside, I got on this red eye out of Calgary, Alberta. And I sat beside this guy who was a race car driver and, and he was flying back to LA. He's from LA. And he told me that his, if he, he was racing in Calgary and the, the, the deal he made with his crew is that if he won the race, he would buy them all a steak dinner and then he would get to fly home and they'd have to drive the car back. But if he lost, they'd all have to drive the car back. So he's flying back. And so he looked, took, took one look at me and was like, geez, what are you doing? And so I told him, he's like, Ooh, you, you don't know anything about anything and you should probably go home. But anyways, he said, yeah, he, he, like, shit, I'm already on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I said, <laughs> So he said, the whole secret to this thing, I, I don't even know why he took me under his wing. He was very kind to me. And he said, the whole secret of this thing is you have to learn how to lose. And he said, that learning how to win is the easiest thing in the world because you just celebrate and you've won. So you're not learning how to win. You're learning how to lose. And learning how to lose is exactly that. It's, it's, getting, it's getting to your next step. And you can't win without losing a bunch of times because that's what you're doing. And what a lot of people do is they, get, is they let discourage, discouragement get in the way, and it, it, which I did as well a, a couple of times. I had some real hairy moments there. But um, a couple of things that I, when I got, so I carried that, I've carried that with me my entire life and, and realized that like failures are actually quite beautiful because it means I did something. You know what I mean? Like I, like I, I wrote a, uh, I wrote a, um, well, I've done lots of stuff that's been rejected, but the, re even the rejection letters and stuff like rejection letters from record companies and from, from publishers, all these sorts of things. They're wonderful because they had something to reject. So much of our lives is like, one of these days I'm going to climb that mountain, you know, but we don't do it because we're afraid of the rejection, but the rejection is actually quite beautiful because it's like, oh, well, of course you rejected that. I've never done it before. Well, at least now you know, at least now you know, like where you stand and it's like, okay, well, I need to do this to maybe not get rejected next time. And, and I, and I, and I have a little benchmark for my efforts. It's like, I did that thing. Like that thing that was like a pipe dream in my head. I actually did it. I completed it and I showed it to somebody and they said, yeah, it's shit. I'm like, yeah, I know. Cause I hadn't done it before, but I, I did it. And so then you, then you, then doing it the second time is like that, like it's twice as easy, twice as fast and twice as exciting because you see all the stuff you did wrong. So I was in school and I was desperate to get a job because I had these children and I had, you know, no money and all that sort of stuff. So I had all these like extra, uh, well, it's not, I didn't have any money. It's just, I didn't have any money, but I, I just, my life was in a, in an odd state because I had young children and only one and zero income and all that sort of stuff. So it was a stressful situation. And uh, so I was really, really desperate. And I remember one of the first things that I did is, is, and I was really bad at it. When I started animating, I was way worse than I thought I was going to be. And in the beginning, you know, when you first are learning something in the beginning, you're excited and you do a couple of things and you go, oh, this is actually quite fun. I, I quite like this. And I was doing 2D animation at the time. I quite like this. I mean, my drawings are moving. And so I was excited by the novelty of it. But then suddenly, like, the, when you start to learn a craft, what happens is the beginning is, is what you expected. It was quite satisfying. It's like, oh, this is exciting. I'm going to learn this craft. And then what happens is you get far enough into it where you can actually see where you need to be. And it's way further than you could have imagined. It's way further. So you're 35, 33, mm -hmm. 35, whatever. You're well, by the time I finished school, I was 35. Yep. 
Yeah. 35. Yep. Two kids. Yep. No income. Yep. And you realize that, oh, hey, I'm not actually as good as I thought I was at this whole animation thing. Yep. You're sending out demo reels. You're getting all that rejection. Yes, it feels kind of okay in a way to know that you're at least you're doing it, <laughs> even if you're getting rejected. But eventually, yeah, yeah. that rejection it, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't no, feel good. No, that rejection didn't feel good because there was just such an, a, an immense amount of desperation that was attached to it. Back in those days, demo reels consisted of VHS tapes, and they were hard to mail out. They were expensive to mail out, so you had to make VHS copies, and so I needed two VCRs, and then you needed the bubble envelopes. I sent out like 25 of them, and nobody cared, and so I sent out another 25, and nobody cared. I didn't even, I didn't even get rejection letters. I got nothing. And so I, I took a job from a, from a, a, a very nice company. They, they made uh, cases. They made boxes, but they were, they were nice boxes. They were cases, like flight cases, if you needed to, to like – transfer something that couldn't get broken, like mostly for computers. Oh, like, <clears throat> like the Pelican cases? Yep. Yep. Yeah, Custom yeah. made Pelican c- cases. Ex- exact, exactly. Oh, what they were. Cool. You know, it was a long way from my house. It was like, you know, the old story, like uphill both ways in the snow, but it was, it was two, two buses and a sky train to get out there. It took me an hour and a half one way. It didn't pay well, $11 an hour. And I, I have a family that I got to support. And, and uh, I was, I was really distraught. I, was sick with with depression and and just self loathing and you know really really painful time in my life and I had these two young children who wanted to engage with me but I wasn't being an effective parent because I just was sick with worry you know my brain kind of took over because your brain can only do that for so well my brain can only do that for so long before it just is like you're gonna kill me here so let's figure something out and so. Uh, I, I, I had this, again, it's one of those like low moments that actually becomes really quite positive. And I, I realized like there's, I just had this epiphany that there's, we're at our lowest in our lives when we feel like we don't have control, when we feel like things are happening to us. And we tend to focus on those things. We tend to focus on the things we don't have control over. And so I decided to, to focus on the things I did have control over. And the list is short. It's always short. The list of the things that you'd have control over will always be shorter. Even Jeff Bezos' list is shorter than the list that he doesn't have control over. Um, and he owns the world. So um, there was a few things. And one of the things was how good of an animator I became. And so I, I was still practicing, even though I couldn't land a job. And most people that I went to school with just stopped looking. But I wasn't going to do that. And the other thing was is like how I greeted the day. And so I, 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 may, I just sort of I made myself – be positive, at least in the face of my children who were like, I had a one and a three-year-old, I think at the time. Um, And then also I decided like, if I'm going to go all the way out to this manufacturing plant and make these boxes, they're going to be the best boxes anyone's ever seen. They weren't, but they were pretty good. I would go out there and I knew that I'm going to be here for eight hours and I'm not going to worry about anything, but how good these boxes are. And, and I did that for, I don't know, even know how long, not that long. It didn't take long. And the owner of the company, a lovely man came to me and said, Hey, listen, I know this isn't what you want to do for a living. My wife works at this studio called Rainmaker Studio and they, they're looking for an animator. I'm happy to put a, give her your demo reel and, and put a word in for you. And that was my first job. And the, the, the thing that I learned about that, which is so, I think is, was, is so fascinating. And I, now that I, I have a company and I hire people and I work with young people, often their first job as well. The quickest way to get out of a job that you don't want to be doing is to either do it really, really badly or do it better than anybody else is doing it. E- either way, you're going to be moving on quickly. Now, if you do it really badly, that's bad for you, uh, potentially dangerous if you're working with power tools, but it's bad for you because your reputation gets shot and there's nothing you can do. And you just work. You, as, I, I mean, that's self-explanatory. Yeah. yeah. But doing you it, doing fired. it, <laughs> you just get fired, but doing it really, really well will, will elevate you out of it. Like it, and it from, from this point on, it always has, it's always people are, what I learned was people are always talking about you when you're not around people who know you. There's a conversation about you happening all the time. And what I've learned is when I 
just push the negativity out and say, if I'm going to be here and I'm going to be doing this task for this amount of time and I've decided to do it and I don't have to, and I've decided to do it, then it, it's in my best interest to, to decide to do it as best as I can possibly do it and to be honest with my shortcomings and to build on them. And like there was things about building these boxes that I wasn't good at. And so I'd ask people, how are you doing this? Like I was engaged to a point where like people were kind of mocking me a little bit about how into this shit I was, but I'm here. Like I'm going to be completely immersed in it. There's no other reason for me not to be. And it, and then I was, then I wasn't there anymore. And it's the same thing. Like now that I'm in, I'm in at this stage of my career, I've been doing this for 20 years. I get people, I, I'm I, it's it's I, I'm so blessed to have people like they just reach out to me and they go, hey, we have this project. We'd love to have you on it. Like I, I have more opportunity that I know what to do with. And it's because they can trust me. It's because I'm going to do that with whatever I do. I'm going to really, 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 really do it. <laughs> you know, and it's it seems simple. But it's not. And Maxine, you've been on productions before where people probably poo-poo it and showing certain levels of enthusiasm where like you you can kind of get mocked. Like you it's risky to be like, I I love this shit. Like that's a risky thing to say. Like it's kind of shows vulnerability. And and what happens is people around you go like, Well, I'm, look at you. And people get upset about it or mad about it because they're going through a, a tough time. So it's, it can be kind of a challenge to do it, but it's always been it's always been the right thing to do. Um, well, it helps you mentally. Like I, I remember yeah. when, when I was in a, at one studio, we were like transferring over our whole production, like tracking system. You know how there's like shotgun, like we had like an internal one, mm -hmm. like shotgun, mm -hmm. and then they're making like a new one, you know? Yep. And so they're slowly migrating all of these new shows onto the new platform and anything that was on the old one, like stayed on the old one. And everyone like was used to the old one. So even mm. though it was like less functional and more like a lot of manual processes, people prefer that because like they just didn't want to learn something new. They're like, oh, I mm -hmm. hate that new thing X, whatever. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I remember I was like fairly new at that studio at the time. And one of the very first shows on this new platform um, like became mine, you know? And I was just like, what else could I do about it? Say no to my manager? Like, no, I got, mm -hmm. I'm obviously going to say, sure, yeah, let's mm -hmm. let's figure it out. And the system was buggy and it was terrible at first and I couldn't get half my stuff done and it was difficult to track everything. And, you know, I ended up working with the dev team and like catching bugs and finding this and like it became my baby. And it was like I wasn't yeah. just trying to get a show done anymore. I was also trying to like launch this whole new platform. <laughs> and I was like, and everyone would like make fun of me like, oh, Maxine, like, how are you doing it? Like, that sounds so crazy. You're dealing with this. And I'm like, yeah, well, I uh -huh. just like, I got to do it. You know, what I mean? like me being upset about it and complaining about this system every day isn't really going to make my life any easier. It's, it's going to make, make it harder. Like shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, I'm just going to like own it and like have a good time. And then by the time everyone had to be rolled onto it, like over a year later or something, it's like, I was like this super user and like, I had all these extra powers in the program. I had like an admin profile. I could like do all this crazy stuff. And I was training people. I became like someone who would train people on it. Mm -hmm. And like it elevated my job. It like made other people aware of my position. Even it's just like huge studio. There's like hundreds of people. And all of a sudden these like management people knew who I was as like a production coordinator, you know, mm -hmm. to, and to be able to move my way up and, and work with other people in different departments that I normally wouldn't have worked with. You know? I, I think it's, it's a, it's a great, um, um, philosophy to, to just like to build towards more responsibility and there you know there comes a, a a time where there's diminishing returns if you're loading yourself up too much it's a good way to position yourself as like let, let me take on as much responsibility as I can I can possibly bear and then let's try some more um so since then since you got that very first job at Rainmaker Studios um you know, you're now successful. We talk about all of your, your accolades, you're doing this, you're teaching people. Obviously mm -hmm. you've got to be, you know, at a certain level to be able to teach people how to do what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really believe in that whole thing. Like when you can't do teach, mm -hmm. 
That's, I mean, maybe some people do that, but I, I, at least in our industry, no, you, like you've got to be able to do this stuff to teach mm -hmm. it um, and successfully. Well, I, I would say you don't have to be, but, uh, well, yeah. um, but I, but <laughs> That's I way am. better. It, it makes everyone's life a little bit better. If For you sure. know what you're talking about. For sure. Um, and so one, one might say that you are pretty successful as, as an animator in this industry, as a creative. And we talk so much about early careers and how to get your start, but what's it like now? So you're like, you're in it, you've had all the dream jobs, like uh -huh. what's on your mind now? Or like, what do you struggle with now as someone who's like made it? Cause I think that's hard to contextualize for a lot of people who, who are just starting out. They just think like, oh, once you're there, you're like, everything's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sailing yeah. through. So what do you struggle with now? It, it, it is, it, it does feel good. Like it's better to be on this side of it than the other side of it. <laughs> Yeah. No question. No question at all. Yeah. You know what? One thing that doesn't ever go away, Maxine, and I tell this to my students, like it doesn't matter how long I've been doing this. Every time I get a new shot to work on, there's always this like, and it's not as loud as it used to be, but there's always this voice that's like, oh, this is the one that's going to expose you as a fraud. You know, what? that's mm. imposter syndrome, right? Well, I don't want to use the word successful, but the 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 more my sort of like uh uh the, the higher up the ladder I grew the more pressure it was to like be good right out of the gate because people are like oh you know pulley blanks here watch what he can do I'm like oh shit no you're overselling it you know what I mean there's like there's there there is a there is a bit of a, a expectation that I'm not always sure I'm going to hit uh, but I I do consistently get invited back so I'm doing something right in the industry when I first started working I struggled with boundaries. And that actually worked in my favor that I struggled with boundaries because I would do anything anybody asked of me because I was so desperate in the mm. beginning. You're just so happy to do something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like I didn't want to, like I, I had the, I had the perspective of like, well, I've worked really bad jobs. And I don't, I don't mean the box thing because that was actually a pretty rad job. Like I couldn't do it for a living because it didn't pay enough and it's just not what I wanted to do, but they're really good people. Today, like I, I do get, I get a lot of, I'm just spread real thin. Let's say this. I'm just spread really thin and I have, that's, that's totally self. Like I'm the, I'm the architect of my own pain that way. And so saying no is difficult because the concern is uh, if you say no to somebody, you lose it. And then suddenly I don't have anything to do. And the person I said no to, I call up and they're like, well, no, you said no. And so that's, that's the fear is that when you say no, that's that. But what actually ends up happening is when you say no, you're more respected because you know your boundaries. And so people trust your, people trust you more when you say no. If, and I, I, when I say yes to everything, I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I can do it. I can do it. Just leave me alone. I can do it. Uh, you get the one eyebrow from people. Mm, he's doing a lot. He says he can do it, but, mm, and then I'm stressed out and I'm like, ah, but then when you say no and people go, Hey, good for you. Like that, then they try, then they, it just makes people want you more because you're in control. Yeah? yeah. You're in control. You know yourself and you're not going to spread yourself too thin. And I do occasionally spread myself too thin. I haven't done it to a point where it's actually damaged me at all as far as physically or you can see I look amazing or <laughs> I mean, how many, how many 24 year olds do you know that look this good? Like zero, zero, zero. I don't, I don't know any 24 year olds. <laughs> I don't either, but it's, it's a, uh, I haven't, I, I haven't done it to a point yet where it's damaged me physically or professionally that I don't, that I know of, but it is a skill I've had to learn, especially as my life has progressed. There's people that come to me and go like, Hey, how would you like to do this with me? And I go, oh, that actually sounds like a pretty good idea. Like, let's start a company. Let's make this. Let's make that. And I have a, I have a particular skill set. Well, I have, I, I have multiple skill sets. And there's no shortage of ideas from everybody, but there's a huge shortage of skill sets. So people come to me and say, I want to make this thing, but I don't know how to do it. Could you do it? I'm like, well, I probably could. And so then I do it. And then they tell two friends and they tell two friends. And then suddenly I'm doing lots and lots of things and they're cool things. And I'm doing them because I just feel there's a, there's a certain, um, uh, 
you know, there's, there's sort of two sides to a coin. There's like the narcissistic side where you're like, you, you just think you know everything and you can't be totally everything. And then there's the masochist, masochistic side where you're a bit of a doormat, you know, and I'm on that side. Like, I just feel very grateful um, that somebody's asking me. Like, I can't possibly say no because I'm just so great. Me? Not me. I'm shitty at this stuff. Well, especially when you had that experience at the beginning of getting rejected and, like, not getting what you wanted out of mm -hmm. school and, like, you know, struggling. I think it, there's so much more pressure to, oh, I got to take whatever I can get. Mm -hmm. whatever opportunity yeah. gets thrown at me like i gotta like latch on to it because yeah i'm like a who food knows hoarder. If that's the last you know what I mean? yeah, yeah yeah it's, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. scary thought like i i grew up with that kind of feeling of like oh i just gotta like take it because you never know that might be the last job you ever get offered like <laughs> it's not going to happen is the thing like yeah. like lo like logically it's not going to happen but emotionally that's a very very hard dragon to slay it takes some therapy it takes some you know some like learning to like understanding myself and and being honest mm -hmm. with myself and, and just understanding like there's there's so much strength and setting boundaries and knowing yourself. There's just loads of strength in that, loads of it. Um, and it's hard to do, but it's very important to do it. And, and honestly, that's my biggest, I would say that's my biggest struggle in life is, is my ability to set healthy boundaries for myself. Very, very difficult for me to do that. And some people are very, very good at it. Um, yeah. I'm not one of them, but I'm learning. It's a skill. It's a skill like anything else. It is. Like so many things. I, I talk to a lot of students about stuff like that. Anything. It's not just the animation and like Maya, but there, there's all of these other little things like communication and like how you interact with people. And oh, like huge. Like sending emails. If you're mm -hmm. not comfortable sending emails right now, it's like, yeah, but just like send some more. Like it's mm -hmm. something, it's a skill just like any other skill that you're trying to learn and it's going to take time to improve at it i'm better with communication because yeah i did have a job where communication was a bigger part of it and i'm not a good animator because i haven't been animating or doing anything right. like that in a long time so it's like yeah that's you get better at things the more time you put into it fledgling animators ask me about you know because everybody's nervous you know and they're like what 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 do you do when you start you like your first day in a studio i always tell them you need to err on the side of over communication you just have to over communicate. Like when I, when I go into a studio and I start working, I know that the production and the, in the, the production coordinators, I know that they're the, they're the lifeblood of the, of the production. They're, they're you, coordinators and producers are the ones who are feeding me the, the work. And, and, and I know how difficult it is for them to like, cause they're not, they're not on the software and they're not, they're, they don't have the ability to just do the shots. And so they're, they're at, like my mercy. And if I don't do it, they're in the front lines. They're going to, they're going to be eating. Uh, they're going to be taking the bullet for that. So before I leave every day, uh, when I'm going to have a job, I walk into the production. There's usually an office production office and there's two or three people in there. And I just go, Hey, so here's what I've done. And it's, I've updated all my stuff and I've sent out an email as well, but I also walk in there and I make sure that I make eye contact and I have an actual physical interaction, not physical. I don't touch anybody typically I've done I, my shots, but I have a, I have an actual human interaction with people and you know, the reactions are often funny. Like the first time I do it, they also sort of sit there like this. Okay. Yeah. But, but the, they get to love it. It's and like, I come in the, and we got the shotgun notification. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, Jesus. Overkill. Did you log your hours though? Did you log your hours? <laughs> but it makes it easy. But, but then, it, then you watch, I watched them when there is a crisis and you can sort of sense there's a crisis in the studio and I watch people come out of the production room and I can see them looking around and they're looking for me. They want to come talk to me because I talk to them all the time. And so they know that I'm engaged and I know like I, I have an ear to the ground with this stuff and I'm open and I'm communicating and I'm taking the time to let them know where I stand. And I'm, and I'm also taking the time to say, I respect you and what you do and I'm letting you know. So then when there's, when there's a crisis, they come to me. And what I really like is I like to be invited into hard conversations. That's really where I, where, you know, my 
skill set. I shouldn't say it's where my skill set lies because you'd have to talk to somebody else who's in, involved in it. Just, and they might say I'm complete shit at it, but I like being invited into like loud conversations in boardrooms where it, shit's mm. hitting the fan because if yeah, shit's, yeah. if shit's hitting the fan and I'm not invited into the boardroom, then you're just outside listening to mom and dad fight. And there's no, that's, that's your back into that, into that section where you don't have any control. So if I'm yeah. in the room, I just feel like I, I have at least some kind of influence on this. And so I don't feel like things are happening to me. As someone who's been a production coordinator and a producer, I would love to work with someone like you. Like it, it sounds. You I really would. Person, <laughs> inevitably. Yeah. I, I think I'd have a, we, we'd, we'd have a good time because inevitably things, um, you know, shit hits the fan. They never go exactly how you plan. They're all a disaster. Ever, Every ever. production's like, a disaster. Like, yeah. Some something gets pushed. And it could be yep. this person's fault or that. It doesn't really matter whose fault it is, but like nothing ever goes exactly as planned. And so it's how how you approach those situations and exactly. working with people like you. And I've seen this happen with artists who are more communicative and like they um, they're engaged with what they're doing and like the bigger picture. They do move up faster. Sometimes it does work to your detriment in the sense that like when something happens and someone else drops the ball or, Oh my God, they've fucked off and we need that shot done. And mm -hmm. oh Mar look who's still here. Mark's still here. Uh -huh. And we know that we can talk to him and be like, Hey Mark, listen. Oh yeah. People, people like that. People like you, um, people with those types of that kind of approach to work it's hugely valued mm -hmm. um, in this industry is that communication thing of not just being in your own bubble. I'm an animator and, you know, sitting in your, your bubble and just doing your thing and going home. And I mean, that's, that's a real problem for, yeah. for a lot of people because this, this trade kind of uh, attracts introverts because it's, it, it's very solo. You're, you're, you're just you alone with your software, but it is a team that builds it. And so even for introverts, you do need to figure out strategies and I'm not an introvert, so I don't know what it's like, or, you know, I, there, I have people that are, and you know, this working with people online is tricky too, because a lot of people don't turn their cameras on. And I think that's a problem. Any given point in time when you're working with in, in a production, you should have as much face time with people as you possibly can. It's only going to work in your favor because th that's the way you get, you make connections and you get remembered and they move on to other productions. When I got invited out to work at, uh, at Weta Digital um, on Avatar, I didn't apply for that job. I got invited to do it based on my reputation and the people that I knew and the, and the relationships that I've made. It was an invitation. That's huge. That's, that's the goal is that your reputation precedes you so much that you're being flown across the, the world to work on a, another mm. production sight unseen, <laughs> you know, they're like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like, Hey, I'm sized to fly. I'm a small man, you know, Maxine, I'm only five foot seven. I'm like 160 pounds. So I'm really good at air travel. <laughs> like I, I curl up on the seat, like a cat just purr the whole way. So we have, like I could talk to you all day, but we got to wrap it up. You say that you struggle to say no to things. So tell mm -hmm. us or tell me a little bit about uh, what you're working on right now. Well, uh, I, I have, I work at CG spectrum. You might know. Yes. I think I'm the first one actually. And you teach at you like a different university or like some different school. I teach at Cal State University currently. Chico as well. Yeah, um, I teach some animation classes there. Um, I started a back in 2014. I partnered with some students and and a, a, another um, a marketing guy here in Chico who had a, who had a successful marketing business. And we started a, a company called Thea Interactive. There's 25 people there, all of them ex students, former students. My core team. Well, are I know one student st that just got, got hired not too long ago. Yeah. So well, a student from yeah, CG Spectrum yeah. did. Elena. Yeah. Yeah. Elena. She's amazing. So I think yeah. she's going to do great. Because I don't know what that company does anymore. It's kind of taken on its own life. I started an offshoot company called Nonstop Motion Virtual Production. And I partnered with a studio out of Vancouver, a friend of mine who's a director, a wonderful director and um, doing virtual production stuff utilizing the unreal engine again for that kind of stuff i think that's everything so uh so yeah thank you and yeah if anyone wants to find mark you can be a student at cg spectrum college or if you're in california cal state university and yeah thank you so much mark it was a pleasure thanks for listening to the cg spectrum podcast 
For more on this episode, visit us at cgspectrum.com forward slash podcast. Check out our show notes where you'll find links to our guests and more behind the scenes. And if you're enjoying the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you're listening or share this episode with someone who might like it. See you next time.